Hi there, everybody. Chesra here. My voice is even hoarser than usual. So do forgive any Alex Jonesian type of gravelly sounds, along with any squeaks which come out from time to time. I'd like to dive right into Zimbabwe because I have a lot to say, as usual. Most people who follow international news will by now be aware that Robert Gabriel Mugabe, who has been the president of Zimbabwe for 37 years, all the way since 1980, has been forced, or shall we say, persuaded to resign. I'm seeing a lot of different opinions, but I can more or less put them into three different categories in the international world. The first opinion is that poor Mugabe is the victim of a military coup with Western backing. Well, I'll agree with the Western backing part. The West has always backed the Mugabe regime, but I will disagree that this is a coup in any traditional sense of the word. The second opinion, vast, broad category of opinion, is that Emerson Mnangagwa, and he is the new president, Emerson Mnangagwa did what was necessary to save Zimbabwe, and Mnangagwa is going to be the great hope of Zimbabwe and the region. That he will be someone who brings stability and prosperity and, and peace back to a very troubled region. Now, <laughs> I always seem to be the bearer of bad news. So let me just preface this by saying I hope I'm wrong, but I personally believe that a leopard does not change its spots. Or in Menangagwa's case, a crocodile does not stop killing and biting. Nangagwa's nickname in the region is Nguenya, Nguenya, and an Nguenya is a crocodile, and it's a very apt nickname because it perfectly describes his ruthless and brutal personality. In addition to being a brute, Nangagwa is a seasoned politician. He has been alongside Mugabe since the beginning, and so he is a consummate politician. He knows what to say, he knows all the right words to use, he's well educated, and he is intelligent. So I would take his inaugural speech with a pinch of salt. I believe in actions, not words, so I'm not really interested in what he has to say. I want to see how it all plays out. And I'm not so sure that by elections next year in Zimbabwe, it's all going to look as rosy as it does now. Okay, to understand the situation in Zimbabwe, you have to go back in time to when Mugabe was first elected in 1980 and just prior to that. And you have to understand that the Southern African region was in fact a Cold War zone. Now, people don't seem to realize this. I don't know if they ever knew but there was a, a power play between Russia, very broadly speaking, and the West. And it was being played out in the theatres of what is today Namibia, Angola, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Mozambique. And I'm just going to focus on Zimbabwe, because otherwise I will never stop speaking. It's a very long and convoluted story. Broadly, what was happening in what was then Rhodesia, and it was named after Cecil John Rhodes, Rhodes Rhodesia, and Rhodes was an awful genocidal man. But anyway, what was happening in uh, then, the then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, was a civil war on broadly three fronts. On the one side was the Ian Smith government, the Rhodesian government, local government, on the other side, there was Robert Mugabe, who was being backed by the British and the United States. And he, he had an opposition party called ZANU, Z-A-N-U. And then the third player was a truly great man, one of the greatest men ever to come from Africa, a man by the name of Joshua Nkomo. And Joshua Nkomo, if anybody in this region or in the entire world should ever have won a Nobel Peace Prize, it should have been Joshua Nkomo. Anyway, Nkomo 
uh, led the Zapu party. So Mugabe Zanu and Nkomo Zapu. Now there are a couple of differences which are absolutely key. Mugabe is a Shona, and this is very important to understanding Zimbabwean history. Mugabe is a Shona, and Nkomo was an Indebele. Mugabe was something of a Shona supremacist, and Nkomo had a more nationalistic outlook. So his view, his vision for the future of Zimbabwe was one where all the different ethnic groups were united under the flag of Zimbabwe. Mugabe saw a Zimbabwe where the Shona reigned supreme and where his henchmen could rule with impunity. So really from the very beginning, Robert Mugabe, despite all the rhetoric that you hear from, from him, have heard from him in recent years, was always cut from colonial cloth. Mugabe was a stooge of the British Empire and they played dirty. He played dirty and he learned how to play dirty from the British. So when the first elections rolled around, his ZANU henchmen, trained by the British and the West and the United States, his people trained by the West, intimidated the Indabele at voting stations, all this nonsense about free and fair elections is such a crock of. There have never been free and fair elections in Zimbabwe. Not ever. These election monitors who come in and declare elections free and fair must be high or very corrupt. So Mugabe won because he played dirty. And Nkomo was actually quite devastated when he saw Zimbabwe the votes going along very much Shona versus Indebele lines, with of course the Shona winning by a huge majority because the Indebele weren't allowed to vote as they saw fit. Now after elections, you would think that Mugabe would have put a lid on his violent and genocidal tendencies, but no he did not, instead he escalated them. And all of this culminated in a most awful genocide. It's known as Goku Harundi, Goku Harundi, which is a Shona word, which means something along the lines of the rain, the early rain, which washes away the chaff. But the chaff is meant in a, word, in a way that implies garbage or trash, something like that. And the Goku Harundi massacre was performed by the infamous 5th Brigade in Zimbabwe. The 5th brigade was trained by the British. Yes, there was some help from North Korea, interestingly enough, but it was really British backed and they attacked and they attacked civilians. They attacked unarmed civilians in Matabili land and in the Midlands, which is where the Ndebele live primarily. The British tried their best to sweep all of this under the carpet. In fact, there is a comment from Prince Charles where he was having lunch with editors from two British newspapers and he said, oh, all this nonsense in Matabili land, it's been so exaggerated, hasn't it? Well, no, no, it had not been exaggerated. If anything, it was underplayed. So why did the British look away? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, they always saw Rhodesia Zimbabwe as their own personal territory where they were entitled to plunder and loot and rape and rob and thieve. And I just quickly want to interject and say I don't mean all British people. I'm referring I'm referring in particular to the British parasitic colonial class which we've had to endure in the colonies. I don't mean all British people. I have no problem with most people in the United Kingdom. I do have a problem with your parasitic predator classes. The British didn't want to endanger their resources. And by the way, by resources, they did not mean farms. The West does not care about food and farming. You must understand this. That's why I'm not really going to go into the whole white farmers atrocity. In fact, I would say that the British would have seen the farms going to rack and ruin as something of a plus. I think the West in general 
favours a slightly homicidal approach and people starving to death sort of culls the population. And this is why I'm not focusing so much on the atrocities visited on the white farmers because they're actually a very small subset of his victims in the broad sense if you look at Mugabe's atrocities as a whole. Now they always talk about land reform and that's such a crock. No such thing as land reform. These farms that were taken away had communities that lived on them and worked around them. There were schools, there were people who spent their entire lives over there and very often there would be something of a symbiotic relationship between the people who lived at the farms and the actual farmers. And I'm not suggesting that every single farmer was a lovely person. They most certainly were not. But these farms actually had communities which were dependent on them. And so when the land was stolen from roughly the white farmers, they did not allow the people who worked on those farms to continue farming them. That would not have been so bad. No, instead, Mugabe took these farms and he gave them these huge parcels of land to his henchmen. And his henchmen were not farmers. Many of them didn't even live in Zimbabwe. And so they didn't care what happened to these farms. They didn't care what happened to the people who lived around them. And in fact, once they locked up the farms, the people who lived around these farms in these communities were not allowed to go into that land. So that land has lain fallow, some of it for decades. And a farm that is not being tended, within a year it just goes to absolute ruin. It's extremely labour intensive. So the white farmers were not really their concern. Also, they didn't want to draw too much attention to this Kukuharundi in case, heaven forfend, they had a rash of people trying to immigrate out of Zimbabwe and into the United Kingdom. Absolutely fascinating that, since these days they take absolutely everyone from any surrounding area in Northern Africa and the Middle East, where they did not have colonies, but people from the former colonies, which they helped themselves to all the resources of these colonies in abundance, they aren't allowed back into the United Kingdom. Anyway, this Kuku Harundi was the most appalling massacre, and in fact you could class it as a genocide. 20,000, 20,000 Ndebele lost their lives. And I think that is a conservative estimate. I have Ndebele friends who, some of them lived through it, some of them were young children who grew up under all of this, and many, many people died, and I'm quite sure that they aren't all accounted for in that number. And it doesn't even take into account the people who were tortured and raped. The most appalling atrocities occurred in Matabili land in the Midlands of Zimbabwe. The type of thing that would make your hair stand on end. And the British knew this. They knew that Mugabe had these inclinations before he was elected, and they supported him anyway, all the way. Some British will tell you that Oh, it was just dissidents that he was genociding. No, no. These people were most definitely civilians. Farmers minding their own business. Little, tiny little tribal villages where nobody bothered him. Nobody was interested in grabbing power. He had absolutely no threat from them at all. So the British politicians who, who implied that this was Mugabe trying to sort out dissidents, that is a terrible and wicked lie and it is completely untrue and they knew it at the time of course they knew Thatcher Blair the Lord of them they all they all covered up for Mugabe the peak hostilities of the Goko Harundi massacre came to an end when Joshua and Cormo decided to throw in the towel and merge Zapu with Mugabe's Zanu some people have accused Nkomo for being a traitor for doing this but this is not true. If you look at what he said then and afterwards, he was very clear that he was very concerned about all the civilian deaths 
and he was worried that a protracted civil war would lead to so many more civilian deaths and, and so much loss of innocent life. And rather than allow his pride to lead the way, he tried to broker a peace and ensure safety for his people, the Ndebele. And then there was a point, of course, where Mugabe, who had been made a knight of the British Empire, his knighthood was stripped and so on. But really, the British have always supported him. His wife has gone shopping in the West. They buy weapons from the West. They trade diamonds and other resources through the West. Yes, there is something of a Chinese and Russian presence. The Chinese presence has actually waned of late. At one time, everyone thought the Chinese would completely take over Southern Africa. And instead, they, they seem to be pulling out to a very large degree, at least in the areas I know about. So, Zapu came to an end at that point, And ZANU, Mugabe's party, has reigned in a de facto dictatorship ever since. And Minangagwa has always been alongside Mugabe as a senior party leader in ZANU. And he's always been tipped to be the next in line once Mugabe kicked the bucket. So if all of this is true, then perhaps you're wondering why was it necessary to bring in the military and have this the Zimbabweans are very funny. They're a very highly educated nation and they're very funny and some of them have called this the democra coup, sort of a combination of democracy and coup. Well, why was it necessary to have this democra coup? Well, the reason is Mugabe's wife, Grace Mugabe. Now, Grace is not only spent like there is no tomorrow and we are talking about millions of pounds and US dollars in luxury goods every single year. But she's also had aspirations to be the leader of Zimbabwe once Mugabe died. And Mugabe is actually quite elderly and very frail and he often falls asleep at, at speeches and public events and so on. So in fact it would be correct to say that Grace has been in charge for the last couple of years. I think what they do with Mugabe, what they've been doing is they're giving him a large spoonful of tonic and saying, you know, just get out there, say your bit, and then you can come back and have another nap. Grace has been systematically dividing and conquering within the ZANU party ranks and trying to get rid of anybody who presents competition or anybody who looks like they might put a spanner in the works for her. One of the people that she picked on was Mnangagwa himself, and he was actually briefly exiled from Zimbabwe. She has had others jailed and tortured. She is a complete psychopath. And I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, not long ago at all, the lovely Grace was at a soiree in South Africa at a luxury hotel. And for no real apparent reason, she took against a model who was also attending. Quite why she did this, nobody can explain. I suspect it takes very little to provoke Grace. But anyway, she pulled out an extension cord, you know, electrical extension cord, and she started to beat this woman. And of course, she always has bodyguards around her, and they did not intervene, because they know bloody well if they intervened, something horrible would have happened to them. So they locked away, and somehow nobody else saw this until the woman was quite badly injured. And she was black and blue, uh, really badly beaten. And then there was this sort of, oh, you know, she's going to face criminal charges and she's going to be arrested and so on. Of course, Grace will never be arrested. She is in that category of person who's never truly held to account for their action. So I'm sure, I'm sure the team Grace Zanu members must be absolutely devastated that she has been thwarted in this way. Grace herself must be Spitting nails. I'm sure she is so furious. I can just imagine temper tantrums and gnashing of teeth and wailing because she really thought she was going to take Mugabe's place when he died. So those who were not Team Grace must be absolutely relieved. They had 
every reason to do this now and not later when she had acquired even more power and gotten rid of even more political enemies. The military intervention was all about getting rid of Grace, not Mugabe. If Mugabe didn't have Grace so determined to interfere in everything and running the show really, then there would have been no reason for a coup. But Grace made it almost impossible not to have one. So as I said before, this isn't a coup. This is a squabble in top-ranking party members of ZANU. And these leaders had every reason to fear Grace entrenching herself even further. Now what Menangagwa did not say in his inaugural speech is what concerns me. He referred to errors in the past, while well, I'd call Goku Harundi a lot more than an error. In fact, Menangagwa facilitated a genocide and as such he is a war criminal. And if anything, he should not be ascending to the presidency of a country, he should be on trial in The Hague as should Mugabe. But of course this world does not work like that. And people in Serbia will certainly know what I'm talking about. What between Milosevic and, and, the, and the latest recipient of Hague justice from their country. Yeah, so I, I can't look at Menangagwa as anything other than a war criminal. I suppose reform is possible. But really the true asset test will come next year in the elections. Because there is another party in Zimbabwe and it is led by a very, very intelligent and decent man by the name of Morgan Svangarai. Now under Mugabe, Svangarai has been absolutely persecuted. He has been tortured, he has been jailed, he has been beaten, he has been exiled. And Svangarai has quite a large following. So I'd like to see how Menangagwa deals with Morgan Svangarai in next year's elections. And I didn't see any olive branch being handed over or a suggestion of free and fair elections next year. Everything that he said seems to indicate that he is entrenching himself in power for a very long time. And of course there are a lot of henchmen in ZANU who have profited immensely under Mugabe and they will continue to do so under Mnangagwa. Actions speak louder than words. And so on that note, I'm going to leave it there and let's see what happens. Thank you.